I'm going to welcome to the stage E.J. Uh, Chichelnitsky. Um, he's a professor of neurosurgery and ophthalmology, and he's focused on another uh, sensory organ, focused on how the retina processes information and really trying to look for ways to cure blindness. Great. <clears throat> well, thanks very much. I really, I really appreciate the invitation to this incredibly interesting conference. I, I was in New York yesterday, so I wasn't able to attend. But I understand that my main directive is to finish on time and, so, and also to hopefully get us to a discussion section that's interesting. I think particularly in contrast with some of the things you just heard from David Eagleman, uh, they, there'll be some fascinating connections here for us to discuss. So I'm going to talk about uh, incurable blindness. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand what a devastating disorder this is that affects millions of people. I'm going to talk about a technology for treating incurable blindness, blindness that can't be, can't be tackled by biological means. And toward the end of, the, of my talk, what I'll tell you about is how this kind of approach to thinking about interfacing to the nervous system has broader implications for interfaces to the brain and to the mind in general. So, Vision begins with light absorption uh, in the retina, and the retina is a sheet of tissue at the rear of the eye, um, of neural tissue, that absorbs light, transforms it into electrical signals, and then transmits those electrical signals into the brain where vision occurs. The retina is what the eye doctor looks at when you go in for an eye exam. In more detail, uh, the way that the retina works is shown here. Briefly, an image from the outside world is imaged by the optics of the eye onto the surface of the retina at the rear of the eye. And the retinal circuitry looks like this. This is a blow up of this little region of the retinal circuitry with the photoreceptors cells at the rear of the eye that absorb the light. Paradoxically, they're at the back. The light comes through the retina and is absorbed by the photoreceptor cells. Then interneurons within the retina that process the visual information very substantially. And then finally, the retinal ganglion cells that send the visual information to the brain. Now, I won't ask you to keep track of many terms in this, in this talk, but I will ask you to remember the retinal ganglion cells. These are the cells that send the visual information from the eye to the brain. Now, in many forms of incurable blindness, what happens is that the photoreceptor cells are lost for a variety of reasons. And consequent to that loss, there's a substantial reorganization of the retinal circuitry that creates kind of a mess in the circuitry, frankly. And um, however, the retinal ganglion cells, the one that send the visual information to the brain, remain there in large numbers. So this then opens up an opportunity for a technical intervention, which is illustrated schematically here. We can envision a device that has a camera, a set of processing circuitry that transforms the signals into, in a way that resembles what the retina does, and then electrodes that electrically stimulate retinal ganglion cells, causing them to send artificial visual signals to the brain. Now, if we can do this effectively and recreate something like the naturalistic visual signals, then the brain will be receiving the same electrical signals it would have seen in natural vision, and we may be able to restore sight. That's the idea. Now, this is not our idea. Many people have had this idea before us, and in fact, crude devices of this form exist now and are available on the market. And there's good news and bad news about these devices. So the good news is, to a first approximation, they do something quite interesting. Namely, people who have been profoundly blind for decades report seeing flashes of light. So that's fantastic. That means there's proof of principle here for treating incurable blindness. On the other hand, unfortunately, the sensations that people experience with these devices are extremely crude, big blobs and streaks of light that are not assembled into a naturalistic visual image at all. At best, you may be able to ambulate toward a bright window and a dark wall, but you can't perform any of the tasks that you associate with vision, such as recognizing facial expressions, seeing fine detail, navigating novel environments, and all the things we normally associate with our visual experience. So why do these devices not work now? Well, many people are working on the problem of making a better grid of electrodes, if you will, that interfaces to the retinal surface. And although that's a valuable thing to do, I'm going to argue that there's actually a more fundamental problem that comes out of the basic neuroscience of how the retina works that connects to talks that we heard earlier, and that that problem absolutely has to be tackled before we can interface to the brain in this way. And the problem is simply the grid of electrodes itself. That idea is not enough. And the reason is that the retina is not a camera. So a camera does a simple thing. It takes an external visual image and it converts it into a grid of pixels. And if the pixels in the grid have the same intensities and colors as the, pic as the pixels in the image, you're done. That's your camera, okay? But the retina doesn't do anything like that. What the retina does is it takes in the visual image and it transforms it into electrical patterns of electrical activity in many different cell types that are sent to a variety of different targets in the brain. And they're all different from one another. 
So the grid metaphor itself is not good enough in the retina. We need to be able to do better than to think about the grid. <clears throat> in particular, we know from many decades of retinal research what that circuitry is in the retina that performs those interesting functions. The photoreceptor cell signals go to many types of interneurons, which come to many types of retinal ganglion cells that send the information to the brain. There's at least 20 or so types of retinal ganglion cells, and they all do totally different things, and I'll show you a little bit about that in, in a minute. So what we need to do to figure out how to interface to this beautiful and precise piece of retinal circuitry is to understand the function of the different cell types and then to stimulate them appropriately. So first to understand their function, we use a technology that builds on research that's occurred over decades of research on the retina um, that's illustrated here, which is recording from large collections of neurons using a 512 electrode array, which allows us to record from hundreds of neurons in the retina simultaneously using the animal model that's the most exact animal model for understanding human visual function. We record those signals, amplify them, and using, using modern technology can see the patterns of activity in hundreds of cells simultaneously. The activity shown from seven out of the 512 electrodes is shown below. With this technology, we can start to understand what all the different cell types in the retina are normally doing with, with visual uh, stimulation. And I'm going to show an actual data slide for the aficionados in the audience. Don't worry if it looks a little bit technical, but I'll tell you the main points. With this kind of technology, we can record from multiple different cell types shown in these different panels. The cells are actually all superimposed on one another, but they've been separated out for convenience on the basis of their distinctive physiological properties. Each cell type covers the surface of the retina and the, the region of the rectangular electrode array, and we can see that the temporal properties and the color properties of the response of all the different cell types are totally different from one another. This is the underpinnings of the retina sending different kinds of visual signals to different targets in the brain, and with this technology, we are able to understand what those patterns of activity are that we ultimately need to reproduce. So the, the idea that you should have in your minds, hopefully now, is that there are multiple different cell types in the retina. They signal different types of visual information with different patterns of activity, and those patterns of activity are transmitted to a, a, a variety of different brain targets. And the game here is to reproduce those patterns of activity. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that all the different cell types are not conveniently separated out for one another here. In fact, they're intermixed on the surface of the retina with different cell types all next to each other splattered in a, in a, in a heterogeneous way across the surface of the retina. So if what we want to do is to introduce our grid of electrodes and reproduce these complex patterns of activity that are different in different cell types, we have a huge problem. We can't do that with a grid of electrodes that doesn't know anything about what the different cells or cell types are and doesn't distinguish them from one another. You can think of this in a metaphor of, of an orchestra that's trying to play a symphony. Every instrument has its particular score. The timing of the music, the, t the notes and everything are very particular for each of the individual instruments. If you were to treat an orchestra as a bunch of undifferentiated instruments and give them different scores and have the conductor pay no attention to what the instruments are, you could certainly create sound but it's not going to be music. It's going to be a cacophony, OK? And that's really what these current devices are doing. They are creating artificial signals that don't respect in any way the patterns of activity that normally impinge on the brain. The goal is to be able to reproduce those patterns of activity based on the basic science knowledge that I've been telling you about. So can we do that? Well, nobody's ever done anything like that in brain-machine interfaces. So we're trying to do something radically new here. So we go in with, uh, with very fine-grained electrodes that are on the scale of the individual cells in the, in the neural circuitry, and we stimulate and record and try to figure out whether we can actually control this orchestra and make it play the symphony we want it to. So it turns out that in many cases we can do that, and I'll show you a nice example of that. Here's my second data slide for the aficionados again, where what we're going to do is to stimulate at a particular location and record the pattern of activity across this large-scale multi-electrode array. What you'll see during stimulation is that first there'll be a big flash of activity, which is electrical artifact that's uninteresting, and then we'll see the neural signal that's recorded with the signal that propagates down an axon toward the brain. So here we go, playing that movie. So first we see a stimulation, artifact, and then a propagation of a, of a visual signal down to the brain. I'll play that for you again just to see it again. So artifact and visual signal propagating down an axon. And we know from our recordings, because we recorded from this retina beforehand, what all the different cells are, what they're doing, and so we know that that's actually the response of an individual neuron sending information to the brain. That's one note played by one instrument in our orchestra. That's cool, because if we can do that on a large scale, then maybe we can put together the real neural code for vision. Now, we haven't tackled that completely yet, and we don't do this all the time, but we do it often enough that the promise is there. Can we expand beyond one cell? We don't just want to play one note. We at least want to play a few notes, and I'll show you an example of that uh, in a different recording, where we first pass light across a collection of cells, a small collection of cells, and we record the activity that the cells produce that's in a temporal sequence determined by their location compared to the bar of light. 
We then go in our experiment, in our, in our rig, and figure out which electrodes activate which cells at which current levels, and then pass current at those times in order to reproduce that response. So we provide electrical stimulation at these times, and we're able to precisely reproduce the responses of the cells by passing current at the right places at the right times. So you can think of this as a small uh, chamber orchestra. We're able to make music with a handful of different instruments. And we are currently working on trying to figure out how we're going to scale this up to be able to control large collections of cells to build um, large naturalistic visual images. Now, how, are we going to, how is a device like this going to work in a patient? Well, we don't know yet, but because we understand the retinal circuitry rather well, we can make competent simulations of how that's going to work. We know that individuals scan the visual scene, and for example, if you're looking at the eyebrow here, your eye is actually jiggling around all the time, and we can reproduce that, such a pattern of activity by stimulating in an optimal way using algorithms that we've developed to got, get the correct collection of cells in the laboratory to do the right stuff when, this, when the eye is doing this. Then we, what we envision is that the, the patient will move their eye around, and as they do, we adjust our stimulation to correspond to the part of the visual image that's being looked at. And over time, we hope, anticipate, expect that our patients will be able to re reconstruct the visual image from this kind of activity. Okay, so. This obviously requires quite a bit of engineering to produce in an actual eye. Everything I've been telling you about so far is in the laboratory, which we view as our prototype for the future device. To engineer such a future device is a huge task. I'm not going to drag you through details of that, other than to tell you we have a first pass design. It involves a lean mean interface, wireless connection to, our, to a, a relay device, which is an important piece of the system, that then connects up to sophisticated external hardware and, importantly, connects up to calibration external to the patient so that we can configure the device as needed. The idea is that this device should be able to read out and figure out what the cells and cell types are right there in that piece of retina where it's implanted. We then use that information to see which electrodes activate which cell types, and then use that to encode the visual image in the way that it's naturally encoded in the patient. To do, engineer something like this requires knowledge that I certainly don't have uh, all of. And so we have a team that's, pr that's putting together this device. It's the Stanford Artificial Retina Project that's funded by the Stanford Neurosciences Institute in our uh, neurotechnology initiative. These are the various individuals performing various parts. We have, have to do the neurophysiology I've been telling you about, digital, analog, circuit design, wireless design, as well as surgery. So this team is putting together the artificial retina that I've been telling you about. I want to I close out what I'm saying in the next couple minutes by connecting this to the larger world of interfaces to the brain. This, as you know, is an interface to the brain, right? The, the retina connects directly into the brain, and we are sending signals into the brain by stimulating the retina. So this is a form of brain-machine interface. There are other kinds of brain-machine interface already out there. A well-known one um, is deep brain stimulation. It's a relatively simple manipulation, but an important one, because in some stages of Parkinsonism, deep brain stimulation is the only effective treatment. OK, so there are other forms of, of brain machine interfaces coming online, as you, some of you know. And of those of you who don't know, I'm going to make, make that pitch for you right now. So I'm going to do that in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way by thinking about the world of interfaces to the brain. This is what you get if you go surf the internet and type brain machine interfaces. Um, obviously, this is not a serious slide. This is a slide to point out to you that people have envisioned for decades building all sorts of devices that interface to the brain. We know that as humans have increasingly sophisticated technology that we can connect to, if it's safe, easy, and gives us cap better capacities, we do it. And you know that because you can just see people walking around all day long with earbuds connected, looking at their phones, and connected as closely to their technology as we can get. As we develop better and safer techniques for interfacing directly to the technology, devices that directly talk to our nervous system, we will do more with that. Not only will we treat more diseases by interfacing directly to the nervous system, but we will extend our capacities. We'll give ourselves, presumably, better memory, better capacity to take in sensory modalities that we weren't previously able to take in, the capacity to control complex equipment that we can't control with our hands, but maybe we can if we connect directly with our brains, and maybe even develop approaches to communicating between individuals in a way that wasn't possible before. So why am I telling you about this grand world of brain machine interfaces? This looks like science fiction when you look at these pictures, but it's not science fiction. At this point, it's science. Not only is it science, it's even beginning to be commerce. As you know, there are companies that are out there trying to do this kind of thing, funding from DARPA and so on. So in this world of interfacing to the brain, the game is to build electronic devices that know how to talk the language of the brain. They know how to interface correctly to circuits and cells. And the reason I'm making this point with respect to artificial retina is that the problems are fundamentally the same. 
In every brain circuit, we have many different cell types. They're configured in very specific ways and talk to each other in very specific ways, and they're laid out in an idiosyncratic pattern. When we introduce our, our electronic devices, we can't just go in with a grid of electrodes and throw a bunch of current in there and hope that we're going to get something sensible out of it. That's not going to work. We have to build devices that are smart. They read the information out from the cells. They figure out what's going on. They figure out which cell is which. They figure out how they're supposed to be working. And then we figure out how to interface to each cell and each cell type in order to reproduce naturalistic patterns of activity. That's exactly what we're doing with the, with the interface in the retinal surface. And we have the technology to do it. The beauty about the retina is several fold. One is that it's a very accessible piece of the brain. It's basically easy to get into, but far easier than something in your cranium. We also know a lot about the retina, so we already understand quite a bit about what those cell types are and how they should be talking to one another. So what that means is today, in 2018, we can design, experiment with, create, and, and soon, hopefully, implant devices that do exactly this. Sense the neural circuit, be smart about it, talk to the cells as appropriate, and reproduce naturalistic patterns of activity. So the hope is that not only we will have a new techn technological treatment for blindness here, but that this will help us to set the stage for developing technologies, approaches, and yes, even intellectual property that hopefully will have an impact on all sorts of brain-machine interfaces of, of the future. That's our vision, and I'll be glad to take questions in the couple minutes that remain. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, so the question is, you take in a two-dimensional view of the image, and you reconstruct, in a sense, a sense of the three-dimensional view of the world. The, and where does that happen? Well, it certainly happens in the brain, as information from the two eyes and from each eye over time is put together in order to create that, uh, that, that 3D sensation. And we also recognize objects, as you point out. And object recognition is complex, and, people, and computer scientists have worked on understanding that for decades, and we're only starting to be able to do that with machines now, using machine learning. So all that stuff is very complex and rich and interesting, and if I had an answer for you like this, I would have the Nobel Prize by now, okay? We don't know how that's done. We know bits and pieces, and people are studying that. But here's what we do know. The inputs to the brain coming from the retina are not as complicated as that. They don't contain the representation of individual objects. They contain under reformulations of the visual scene. You can think of them a little bit like Photoshop filters that distort and alter and, and emphasize different pieces of the visual scene, each of the cell types doing a somewhat different thing. They're not super complicated like that. They're something that we can actually reproduce. And if we can feed that information to the right cell types, then that information is actually going to its correct target in the brain. That's the beauty of it. Once you got the cell types, you're hooked into the natural wiring. Once you're hooked into the natural wiring, the brain has the capacity to perform its normal functions, such as creating 3D representations, recognizing objects, and so on. We hope that we can harness that, that native capacity that exists in the brain by feeding it the right kind of information from the get-go. I have a few more seconds for a question if anybody has one. Yes? That's a great question. The question is, whether would it, is, is this only going to work in people who have already seen at some point? For sure, those are the first targets that we will go for, because they will have, presumably, an intact brain that can do these things that we want, want it to do. People who have never seen before will have very altered visual cortex and so on. In fact, they will have emphasis on different kinds of sensory modalities. The question there is, how plastic is the brain? And that's a huge debate, a great one for coffee over here, which I'm, I promise to free you up to do. And, and I think that the question there is, how plastic is it? Will we be able to um, control the retinal signals in a way that will enhance the capacity for the brain to learn and, and you know, become plastic over time? A great lesson comes from, the, from cochlear prostheses, which are now routinely implanted in children in order to allow them to develop natural natural hearing or somewhat natural hearing so that they can actually process language. And we will take inspiration from that. It's much more complicated in the visual system, which is why we do all this work. Um, but I think the same inspiration is there. Thank you.